what I've been asked to cover is funerary ironwork of the 19th century. Um, so just very briefly on myself, um, my name is David Humphreys. I'm a director of ACP, uh, architectural conservation consultants based in Maroo County Limerick. I've been working in the historic buildings, historic landscape environment for nearly 30 years. Um, eight of those years were with English Heritage. I'm a chartered landscape architect, chartered project manager, and a chartered building surveyor. And over the last number of years, I've been training in historic ironwork, and we now have a consultancy services on uh, dealing with historic ironwork. So what I'd like to cover in terms of the outline of the lecture is we'll do a very brief history in historic ironwork. I'd like to touch on the types of iron that we deal with, their uses in funerals and graveyards, where we're at in terms of the current status, and where the future is. So, not being an archaeologist, but I felt that I needed to go back to try and set some sort of scene. And if you look at the archaeology literature, um, Margaret Williams published a paper in Trowell, um, Transformations Assessing the Relationship Between Iron Working and Burials in Early Medieval Ireland. And what she said was the association of burials with iron working has its origins in the Iron Age and continued into the early medieval period. So, Burials and ironwork and funerals go right back. That sets us with a situation where I'd like to just cover the brief history of iron. What we have on the screen here is a piece of iron ore. And some people say that the iron in our lives goes right back to early BC into the Iron Age, right up into the 19th century, where it started to change. Iron ore makes up 5% of the Earth's crust. Um, you take your piece of iron ore, you smelt it. Literally, you put the iron ore into a furnace with charcoal, or with, it would have been traditionally charcoal, and you melt it down and you get a piece of bloom, which you hammer out all the impurities, and you end up getting wrought iron. Blast furnaces came in. I was at a, a conference in Clare, uh, two weekends ago about it, and I'll just briefly cover that. And in the, 18, in the 19th century, we had the introduction of the Bessemer converter, which really changed the whole industry from wrought iron to what we now regard as steel. Steel, which was always possible to produce, but was very difficult. The Bessemer converter in the 18th, 18, uh, 19th century brought manufacturing into it. So we start to see the introduction of steel rather than iron. Our early sources of iron, meteorites. Um, crashing onto the earth. Other sources would have been, you dig out the iron ore, you put it into um, an, early, an early furnace. You can see there was two different types. Um, and you find that you had a situation right up into the uh, 19th, right up even into today, where you have blast furnaces predated by these, I suppose you'd call them a bit more primitive blast furnaces. There's a bloom of iron. It's basically a lump of hot iron with all the impurities. And the way to bring it down is the, um, in a forge, it would be hammered. All the impurities would be hammered out slowly reheated, folded, hammered again. That will give you wrought iron. And if you look carefully at the wrought iron, you notice that there's a grain in it. It's almost like timber. It's got a grain, and in working that material, you have to take that into account. It's also got impurities into it, it in terms of slag and other materials, depending on how well processed it was. A medieval blast furnace, in this, um, these were the early precursors of the blast furnaces. And as technologies advanced, these became more productive. The blast furnace was very slow in terms of producing material, and it, it, it um, covered a lot uh, in terms of using up a lot of uh, timber. So you would have had a number of hectares of timber used to produce um, a day's burning of, um, in a blast furnace. The Industrial Revolution really started in England, in called Brookdale in the 1700s, and you find that from then on, our, the 
the use of iron started to be industrialized. And once you get into the Victorian period, we start to see the industrial influence of um, iron production coming out in our graveyards and in other places. Bessemer converter brought in in 1855 really intensified steel production. It changed the whole landscape in terms of historic iron work. We have the outputs of that is what we see now today are steel knives, all sorts of different steels, hard, very hard, all sorts of additives, stainless steel and so on. Um, our blacksmiths would not be able to cope with this. And you have mild steel, which many people at this stage confuse with um, historic iron or wrought iron. They're not the same material. Iron production in County Clare, two weekends ago, I was at a Historical Metallurgical Society conference looking at iron production medieval times in County Clare. And you can see just in the Slievahi Mountains, around the 1600s in East Clare, there was an absolutely huge iron production and smelting industry. There is very little or no evidence of it there today. The towns of Scariff, Mount Shannon, Tungraney, all began with this industry. The families, it was through genealogy that most of this was actually discovered. The family names around there were found to have come in from the north of Ireland, from England, and from other countries. And that was, that was the industry they bought in. Schlievati, it was at medieval times, there was lots of timber, lots of iron ore, and lots of water. There's little or no evidence now. Two furnaces in County Clare, one on the left on this side here is just outside Tungraney. On the first edition uh, ordnance map, it's marked as an ironworks. There's very little of it there today. There's also another one in near Whitegate in a townsland called Furnace. That's on the 1840s map as well. It's not on the modern maps. This, these couple of photographs are from that field visit, uh, looking at the remains of the 16th, 17th century blast furnace. Um, there is a proposal to excavate that in two years' time by a team of archaeologists. So let's get into funerary ironwork. Talk about the 19th century funerals and this image of grave robbers come up. And that has had a huge influence on funerary ironwork. The questions we have to ask ourselves today now is what uses was iron put to in our funeral traditions? It's a, it's a valid question that we need to ask. What types of funerary iron work are there, are at risk? Are, we, are they at risk of losing it now, and so on? Are we aware of, of it and its importance? In most cases, we're not. We tend to walk over this stuff and really not think of it as being important from our heritage point of view. Where was it made? In some foundry, was it brought from, was it made in a local foundry, of which there were a number in Limerick, there was a foundry in Waterford, a number in Dublin, and there was huge foundries in, in uh, Scotland, in, particularly in Glasgow. Was it made by a local blacksmith? You can have a lot of cast iron railings, of which we'll typically see these around our graves, were bought straight off of a catalogue. Gates, railings, gra uh, graveyard or grave markers, were in many cases bought straight off a catalogue in the 19th and early 20th century. McFarland's castings in Glasgow, this is an example of their catalogue, which in many cases was as big as a telephone directory. And you went in, you picked out the piece you want, you could buy literally anything. All sorts of fittings for um, pipe work, domestic appliances and so on. They were almost like iron was used then as we use plastic today. Grave robbing had a big, huge influence. And of course, the iron smiths were brought to bear on this. A deterrent to grave robbers was the mart safe. An example like this is a type of cage put over the graves and locked. Another type of example were done on individual graves. It'd be reasonably difficult to rob the grave with that over it. In other cases, you went, they went to other extremes where they put a gun into the coffin. 
so that when the robber opened the coffin, the gun fired, and you had two, you had two funerals. <laughs> Quite ingenious. You had other situations where individual coffins had iron lids and sides locked to make sure you couldn't get out. Or, sorry, get in to get someone out. <laughs> And in Downing Cork, I found this old photograph of a graveyard down in Cork, which is where you had a railing with literally a railing roof on it. it I've been at the graveyard. That, I can't find that. But that's an, an, early 19th, or an early 20th century photograph. But the extremes that people went to is quite amazing. The Dennis Mausoleum in Galway. Um, quite an amazing uh, art of, or, uh, example of the use of cast iron in, in burials. This mausoleum was um, put up by Colonel Dennis. He was buried in it. It's completely cast iron, and it was restored a number of years ago uh, with, with aid from the Heritage Council and the Galway um, Conservation Office. You can see on this last photograph the type of detail you can get, because what you make is you make a sand mold and that's poured. And that then can be put together like a jigsaw piece. And you can have quite beautiful material. Cast iron is very durable, provided it can dry out. And it's very, very strong. More strong in compression than in tension. But in this case, it was a suitable material for a mausoleum. Other uses we find, if we look at our old purses, you'll find decorative ironwork, as well as decorative brass and all of that you'll find cast iron crosses. This is a, quite a fine example. You can see the very, very good detail and fine detail that can survive. And one of the unique ones is um, the ironwork bells and appliances that the Victorians used um, in case they woke up dead inside in the coffin and they could pull a string or a bell or something. Walker, the other one that I found quite interesting was these cast iron coffins. Um, an American in 1848, uh, a guy called Fisk, patented a cast iron coffin. And if you were alive at the time and you were looking for an undertaker, there was adverts where you could get your cast iron coffin. And one of the stories that goes with it is that these were so well sealed that as the body broke down and the gases um, increased the pressure on the coffin, it actually exploded. I haven't seen an actual example of one of these, but you can see the type of uses and the, the way people were thinking. So let's go into our graveyards. What are we going to find? If we look at any publications that we have about graveyards, and you see very little about our arm work. It's hardly highlighted. Heritage Council, Irish Historic Churches and Graveyards, I don't see any arm work on it. It's about stone. But I'll, you go into the graveyards and you'll start firing iron if you open your eyes. Let's look at raw iron and forged, where you have mixtures. This is a simple cross made out of a recycled band iron off a wheel. Possibly what happened was when the person died, a member of their family went to the local blacksmith and asked them, could they make a cross? Blacksmith because iron was scarce, had a piece of band iron, cut it up, split the ends, uh, forged them over on the, the bick of the anvil, and put the two pieces together, riveted together, and maybe put on some sort of nameplate, and that was your cross. Simple, effective, local. No one really thinks of it as having any value, but it has huge value. Vault doors, mausoleum doors, you go over to Abington Graveyard, two fine mausolea there. There's the Wilkinson's Graveyard, which cast iron door, still working perfectly today. You look at name plaques. In this case here, what you had was a typical name plaque bought off a catalogue. That you'd send off the details to the foundry, and it would come back with the inscription on the name plaque. In this case, you can see the two legs of it are actually a piece of wrought iron where the original um, cast iron plaque broke off and some, someone inventive went and got the local blacksmith to fix it. 
you have situations where you have a mixture of cast and wrought. In this case, where you have the cast iron, the little uprights, the wrought iron in betweens. Decorative railings, in this case, almost completely wrought iron, except the little finials are, hit, are on the top are uh, wrought iron, leaded in. The rest of it is done locally by a blacksmith. So it's really unseen before our eyes. We walk into a graveyard, and this is what we see, dereliction. And we don't really take any real appreciation of it. But if you look at just that piece of railing in detail, you will find that it is a combination of a lot of pieces that were recycled and the techniques that the blacksmith used were actually trying to make the best of the material they had. We look at it today and we don't, really don't see it. It's forgotten. At the back of Abington Graveyard, there's this fine long piece of maybe five or six meters of wrought iron thrown in the ditch. That would have been in its life a fine railing of some description rusting. So the skills that we have, if you look at uh, a gaze typically going into Tungrani graveyard, the type of skills to make this type of lock. You can see that there are all sorts of techniques. You have punching, tapering, a little bit of fire welding, um, tapering, scrolling, all of that. All techniques done locally by a blacksmith. Again, you can look at how the piece was put together. The, um, the piece that was going around in the curve was split, was widened so that it could be fitted together, and then there was lead used to fill in the in-between. Very quickly, historic iron work and steel is different. The reason they're different is because of the amount of carbon that's in the, in the iron. Wrought iron has a very low percentage of carbon. Cast iron is quite high, making it quite brittle, Steel is somewhere in between, and that's the difference, chemically. Wrought iron is no longer available. You can get some of it recycled from England, but it's really not, no longer manufactured. Historic iron work is wrought iron or cast iron. It is not steel. You go into a wrought iron uh, company, and they tell you, we're giving you wrought iron gates. You're not getting wrought iron gates, you're getting steel. We have a situation where you have the modern, using modern techniques versus the traditional. Fabrication, beware of it. This situation here, a fine set of gates and railings. When they were repaired, they were actually removed in mass, on, in total, and a modern replacement put in. And if you look at the pier on the, over on the right, you're right, you can see the remains of where the fixings were. That was called restoration. Now where are we? We're dealing with an invisible part of our heritage. It's rusting away in the graveyards. We have a lack of appreciation, I believe, in what we have. We have a lack of appreciation of the ironwork and the danger it's in. The loss of material, it's no longer available. And more importantly, I think the loss of the unique skills required to do the work in terms of blacksmithing. There is the danger of fabrication and modern techniques being used to substitute for what should be the real uh, thing. The lessons we can get, we need to start opening our eyes. We need to get to know what we have out there. We need to understand its importance as part of our unique heritage, in many cases local, like that little simple cross. You should do nothing until you have the right advice. You will cause more damage than if, if you go at it without the right advice. You need to use, in many cases, a blacksmith, not a fabricator. And in all cases, traditional materials require traditional techniques. What next? Do nothing is, doing nothing is better than losing stuff through bad advice. Once it's gone, it's gone, and that's the end of it. Seek advice, we can help. Thank you, David Humphreys. All right.